Today I'll be discussing in depth what I believe to be the strongest unit in the game. I've linked in the description below to a companion video in which I showcase a playthrough that I believe validates the claims made in this video. The unit that I'll be discussing is reliant upon a very counterintuitive strategy, and as such requires a fairly significant amount of explanation and theory crafting so as to understand exactly how and why it is so effective. The squad composition will be comprised of the following soldiers. At a minimum, you'll want to take one skirmisher, and three specialists slash medics. Now, optionally and optimally, if your squad can accommodate up to six, you'll also want to include one reaper and one sharpshooter. The reason this strategy is so unique is because it violates nearly every accepted best practice as to how to conduct combat in XCOM 2. The entire premise of this setup is to only send your skirmisher into range of the aliens. I don't care how many enemies there are. I don't care if it's the scariest combination of aliens that you've ever dreamt of. If she isn't alone, it won't work. You want her to be the only one that the enemy focuses all of their attention on. You want her to get shot at as much as possible every single turn. And being that this is XCOM, that isn't usually very hard to accomplish. Depending on the nature of the mission, the remaining soldiers, with the exception of the Reaper Scout, are usually either left in the starting area, or I will perch them high atop some faraway building and let them get a good view of the carnage, whilst occasionally throwing in a pot shot if someone strays too far from the fray. Or, on timed missions, I'll often split the map into two distinct sides and run one group along one edge of the map, and the lone skirmisher along the other side. The skirmisher will spend nearly every turn doing the same things over and over again once she has encountered the enemy. She will either be moving with the first action, or reloading with the first action, but she will almost always be hunkering down with the second action. That's it. The temptation may exist to do much more, but don't. That is until you get the hang of it. Just hunker down. It's pretty dummy proof. When she moves, you should always prioritize moving towards the objective, into cover, and directly adjacent to an enemy, preferably more than one. Secondarily, you want to pop as many pods as you can. Yep, you heard me right. You want your skirmisher fighting as many aliens at one time as she possibly can. And right about now, I, I think I know what you're thinking. You're likely thinking, you know, I don't think this guy's ever played XCOM before. Or maybe, maybe he's trolling us into killing all of our skirmishers out of some misplaced hatred that he has towards the character class. However... I'd ask that you withhold judgment on those thoughts until you hear the logic behind it. In order to best understand how this strategy works, one must delve deeper into a seldom explored subject in XCOM 2, and that is the stat known as defense. Because XCOM 2 has been traditionally viewed as an alpha strike game, the conventional wisdom has always been that it's best to eliminate any visible enemies prior to the enemy having a chance to act. And whilst this strategy is certainly a sound one, it is not always achievable, especially for novice players. And horror stories of the RNG gods wreaking havoc on an otherwise tactically sound plan litter the community posts. However, given the right set of circumstances, defense can be a much more meaningful stat than we would be led to believe. In order to understand its importance, we have to first understand what defense actually does. The defense stat is directly subtracted from the shooter's aim stat in order to determine their chance to hit, with a plus or minus for any weapon range modifiers on top of that. The following are examples of things that can provide defense, and take special note of the fact that these bonuses do stack with one another. Half cover provides 20 defense, smoke, 20, full cover, 40 defense, aid protocol, 40, Hunker down, 30 defense. Thus, with those numbers in mind, let's envision the following scenario. Picture a unit that hunkers down in a position of half cover and then has aid protocol applied to it. That unit's defense would be 90 until their next turn. That means all aliens that attempt to shoot at that soldier would have their aim stat subtracted by 90 in order to determine their chance to hit. However, as many of you are aware, 
the aliens can negate the cover bonus by acquiring a flanking position on that soldier. But as many of you may not be aware, this does nothing to negate the bonuses conferred by either hunker down or aid protocol. Thus, if the very same soldier were flanked by an alien, he would still have 70 defense and apply that substantial reduction to the enemy's chance to hit. And when you think about the fact that on legendary difficulty, outside of the avatar, no alien's aim stat is above 80. So with that fact in mind, it isn't hard to see why you won't be getting hit very often with the employment of this strategy. Additionally, the hunker down action negates the enemy's chance to land a critical hit. Thus, even if they were to connect with a shot from the aforementioned flanking position, the damage would likely be extremely manageable. But were that not already enough, hunker down also confers 50 dodge. This dodge amount can be combined with other dodge increases the soldier may have acquired, either through equipment or through covert ops, and can be increased to the point where all hits that do make it past your defense become grazed shots and do further reduced damage. With this defensive layering, it is completely conceivable to make any soldier in the game nearly unkillable for a single turn. But as many of you know, the point of this game isn't merely to survive, but rather eliminate the alien threat. And this is where the skirmisher begins to uniquely position herself for this strategy. The skirmisher is a unique unit in a myriad of ways. She has the ability to perform many of her class actions with the first action and still utilize a second action. She has access to Retribution, which is essentially a clone of Bladestorm. She has a grapple that she can use to pull herself towards enemies or pull them to her. She has a melee weapon that applies status effects, either stun or fire. She has a skill that makes enemies that target her have a chance to panic if they do so. She is an adversary to one of the chosen and therefore does additional damage when engaged in combat with that one, and she frequently has access to a skill that makes this build really thrive, and that is the sharpshooter skill of Return Fire, which can often be acquired through the training center as a purchasable XCOM skill. Since she can easily be made unkillable via the application of the aforementioned defensive layers, she unlocks the true potential of Return Fire, Judgment, and Retribution to deal massive damage to would-be attackers. It isn't uncommon, for instance, to open a combat with a Reckoning melee attack, get three additional Retribution attacks on that adjacent pod as they spread out to positions of cover, take an Overwatch shot via Threat Assessment, get two or three Return Fire shots on the alien's turn, and potentially a few more Retribution attacks if any other enemies come into melee range. This of course says nothing to the amount of enemies that might begin to panic and start shooting each other through the application of judgment. All of this whilst frequently receiving little to no damage in the process. This process of charging the enemy's position and hunkering down can be repeated time and again, and the aliens will continually try to hit you in vain whilst receiving a steady stream of damage for their efforts. The only imperatives that must be followed every turn are that the skirmisher must continue to move directly adjacent to aliens and towards the objective in a timely fashion, must be in cover and hunker down, and must have aid protocol applied. The rest mostly takes care of itself. Of note, it is recommended that you develop a tier 3 bond between the skirmisher and one of the other party members. Because of the ability to grant two additional actions throughout the mission to the skirmisher, this vastly increases the number of tactical options that the skirmisher can deploy in the heat of battle. As you can see here, the optimal equipment for the skirmisher using this strategy is as follows. As for abilities, the following abilities are recommended. Since the skirmisher is such a consistent and instrumental part of this entire strategy, when your skirmisher isn't either in combat or healing, you'll want to send them on covert actions so as to increase their stats. The following missions are those that you should target. Now there are those that will point to the fact that some of these optimizations and abilities that I have referenced here come late in the skirmisher's development, such as Judgment for example. 
However, this strategy does not need those optimizations in order to succeed. And it grows nicely as the mission difficulty increases. Right about the time when some players are starting to feel a bit stretched thin with their conventional squads, either due to fatigue, negative traits, injuries, or heaven forbid, a squad wipe, this strategy becomes a completely viable plugin that can be used to aid in giving those more conventional squads some much needed recovery time. With the exception of the skirmisher, every other squad member need only have acquired the rank of squaddy to make adequate use of the essential elements of this strategy. And speaking of the other squad members, the unsung heroes of this strategy and the ones that truly keep this engine of war operational are the specialists slash medics. I frequently refer to them as medics because thematically they're largely tasked with the well-being and safety of the skirmisher. This is largely through the application of aid protocol and medical protocol. Since aid protocol has a three-turn cooldown when paired with threat assessment, it is imperative to bring at least three specialists on your mission. That way, they can rotate the task of applying aid protocol every turn in perpetuity. It is important to note that all medically-based skills do not require line of sight or have a proximity restriction. Thus, all skills can be applied to the skirmisher regardless of her position on the battlefield. The medics will also be tasked with healing the skirmisher in the event that she takes damage from an attack that cannot miss, an area of effect attack, if she takes fall damage, or the random shot happens to get past her defense. Provided that a player is not taking excessive risks, it is exceedingly rare that that damage would exceed the amount that could be healed with one charge of a medkit, of which her group of three specialists will have 12 in total. Also, the remote application of the medkit will heal poison, so that too becomes a point of no concern. On the occasion that a specter is present on the battlefield and elects to use Shadowbound on the skirmisher, the specialists can also remedy that via the application of Resurrection Protocol. Rounding out the protection that she already receives from the Mind Shield, there is almost nothing that the skirmisher can encounter that cannot be solved from across the entire battlefield by the team of medics. However, lest one think that the medics are somehow the vulnerable party to this strategy, it would be foolish to underestimate their offensive power. Given the fact that aid protocol and medical protocol only take a single action, every specialist will have a remaining action that can be used for offensive actions each turn. From turning into a guardian buffed overwatch unit, to unleashing a volley of missiles or blaster launchers from their warsuits, to hacking the entire battlefield, or just picking off every injured unit with combat protocol, the specialist trio are a force in their own right, and every bit as dangerous as the skirmisher. Anything that erringly walks too close to them doesn't tend to live for very long. As you can see here, the optimal equipment for the specialists using this strategy is as follows. As far as abilities, the following are recommended. The final remaining pieces of the puzzle are the Reaper and the Sharpshooter. The Reaper's role is firstly that of Intelligence Gathering Scout, secondarily defending the Skirmisher with Banish against the few very real threats that could actually harm her, and lastly as an accelerant that can covertly clean up a few wounded enemies that are attempting in vain to battle the Skirmisher. As you can see here, the optimal equipment for the Reaper using this strategy is as follows. As far as abilities, the following are recommended. The sharpshooter's role is purely as an accelerant that combines squad sight with the skirmisher's forward position in order to create a steady stream of damage from across the entire length of the battlefield. As you can see here, the optimal equipment for the sharpshooter using this strategy is as follows. As far as abilities, the following abilities are recommended. Of special note is the fact that the Sharpshooter is a perfectly viable alternative to the Skirmisher in this strategy. He inherently has access to the return fire skill, and often earlier. He doesn't have to ever reload his pistol, and once he gets quick draw and lightning hands, he will have a fairly consistent way to deal damage with his first action while still saving his remaining action for hunker down. His most notable weaknesses as compared with the Skirmisher are his lack of retribution, movement enhancing skills, lightning reflexes, judgment, 
and the fact that the pistol has no weapon upgrades. The rest of his skills represent a fairly balanced trade-off with the remainder of the skirmisher skills. However, once the sharpshooter has acquired the hunter's rifle and pistol, it is conceivable that, with the right combination of XCOM skills, he could rival or surpass the skirmisher in a few situations under this strategy. This is of course more of a testament to how game-changing those particular weapons can be, and not so much the underlying class itself. Overall, regardless of which class you choose to spearhead this strategy, it is nearly flawless in its survivability. However, there are a few things that one must be cognizant of that may require a modification of tactics. The following are enemies of note or concern. The Advent Priest. The priest only has one thing that is of concern to the skirmisher, but it is the number one consistent threat to this strategy. That threat is the ability of stasis. If the priest places the skirmisher in stasis, though the skirmisher will be invulnerable for the duration of stasis, stasis itself ceases to function at the beginning of the alien's turn. Because of this, you will be without hunker down or aid protocol for the duration of the entire enemy turn. And if you are surrounded by alien forces, as you likely will be, this will almost certainly result in the skirmisher's death. Sectopods. Sectopods are one of the few enemies that readily transitions to using their AOE attack, in this case lightning field, when their chance to hit a single soldier is too far compromised by your defensive layers. This can sometimes be mitigated by being on a different elevation level than the sectopod. But, if that elevated position is one that can be destroyed, the sectopod will gladly demolish it on its move and send the skirmisher crashing to the ground. Though the sectopod is very unlikely to deal you a fatal amount of damage in any one turn with its attacks, a more concerning sequence of events is that it is already standing directly adjacent to you, manages to wound you, and then the skirmisher manages to execute it, often through return fire or threat assessment, thus causing it to explode. This sequence easily deals well more than 10 damage to your skirmisher and can be problematic if you're not at full health at the beginning of the turn. Fall damage and any other AoE damage is also of note. In the case of fall damage, it is best to avoid using any destructible elevated position, especially when engaged with heavy mechs. In most non-elevated cases, mechs will opt to take a regular shot or attempt to suppress the skirmisher, but in the aforementioned elevated case, heavy mechs will almost always opt to use their AoE rocket launcher and destroy the elevated position you sit atop thus sending the skirmisher crashing to the ground. Additionally, in the case of AoE damage, it is important to note that it will be difficult to predict which enemies will die during the next attack phase and where they will be in relation to the skirmisher when they do so. Thus, it is best practice to keep life totals high in the case that multiple enemies explode adjacent to the skirmisher in a single round of combat. With respect to the Chosen, none of them pose a significant threat. However, the assassin is unique in that she has the katana, which completely bypasses any chance to hit equation and deals automatic damage. However, this damage alone is likely never going to be enough to kill the skirmisher, and more likely than not is just going to require the consistent application of medkits in order to mitigate it. And lastly, it is worth mentioning that though this strategy dominates two of the three alien rulers, the Archon King represents a significant area of concern, and I would only recommend attempting this strategy to the most adaptable of commanders. The reasons for this concern have to do with his special abilities. Firstly, the ability of Devastate is concerning because it represents an unavoidable AoE attack that will not only harm your skirmisher, but could also likely disrupt your medic's ability to continuously apply aid protocol if they find themselves too close to the battlefield and get caught in the AoE attack. But most concerning is the Icarus Drop, which could be best conceptualized as a form of stasis that also does damage to the skirmisher. The fact that the drop is completed on the alien's turn, once again, means that the skirmisher will be without her defensive stack and will have also taken a substantial amount of damage from the Icarus Drop itself. Survival in this situation is unlikely at best. This strategy is 100% viable on legendary difficulty, and only becomes that much more effective on lower difficulty levels, 
due in large part to the fact that the enemy has lowered aim, less armor, lower life totals, and being much more susceptible to panic. This strategy is optimally suited for untimed missions and single objective timed missions. Multi-objective timed missions, such as retaliation missions, are more challenging and thus I'd only recommend that seasoned commanders attempt them with this strategy. If one is looking to employ this strategy throughout their campaign, it is often best practice to start with the Skirmisher HQ, as this will allow you to receive two Skirmishers over the course of the game. The fact that the Skirmisher HQ is the best HQ to have at the beginning of the game is also a nice bonus. This strategy is not intended as a full replacement for all of your other squads, but rather allows you to consolidate the rest of your very strong soldiers into a third dominant squad instead of having to spread their strength out and risking them getting tired, injured, or acquiring negative traits. Ultimately, this strategy provides a means of turning the table on Advent and making them feel as though they're the ones that are playing XCOM 2. Through unmatched defensive prowess and unorthodox offensive measures, this strategy could form the backbone of your very next playthrough, should you decide to give it a try. As mentioned previously, I have created a full playthrough companion video in which you can observe the minutia of this strategy in full so as to better understand its nuances. And as always, if you like this strategy video and wish to support this channel, please feel free to like, subscribe, and share this video so that I can provide more content like it in the future.